So today we're going to start finalizing our study about the weather and we're going to take all these pieces that we've talked about so far and we're going to put them together and talk about how, how storms are formed. And our first piece of the storm puzzle is going to be about fronts and thunderstorms. First of all, what a front is. A front is where two different air masses meet and we have discussed this before. You can see that that is a different chunk of air than that right there and this line right here where they meet that's what's called a front and you can see the front very dramatically here on this page between the dry air mass and the wet air mass and where those two air masses meet that's where all the action is now there are different types of fronts there's different types of interaction where they meet each other the first one we're going to look at is what's called a cold front so i'm sitting right here and i've got some nice warm air and say some colder air comes towards me say in here in georgia it's coming up from canada but what's going to happen is that cold air is going to make my warm air go up because cold air is more dense than warm air and the warm air is going to rise now the warm air also typically has more water in it because you know warm air holds more water than cold air so what you're going to happen what's going to have happen is you're going to have clouds form when a cold front come in comes in because it's going to take the warm wet air and push it up in the sky where it's a little bit colder forms clouds here you can see a very dramatic cold front here we've got some cold air coming down from canada and we have some warmer air in place already so this cold air is coming down and it is pushing itself into where there is warm air now here's a, a picture of a dashboard thermometer in my car and you can see in the upper left it was 74 degrees and note the mileage here 18 well here the mileage is only up to 22 so i went four miles but look at the change in temperature the temperature went down eight degrees in four miles and this is wasn't a case where i went up and down a mountain this was strictly because of a change in the air mass i went from a warm air mass into a colder air mass and that point where they meet is called the front this was taken when i was coming back from florida after a vacation and florida nice warm wet air and i moved somewhere into georgia where i entered into that colder air that had come down from canada where they met that's called a front here's what it looked like what was happening as i was driving into that colder air the warm air from florida was being pushed up into the sky which of course then formed clouds and formed rain so cold fronts are going to form clouds and form rain this is kind of a visual representation of what it looks like here's my clouds here's my cold air coming my warm air has to go up make clouds here's the example of a cold front it was 60 degrees and here it was 37 degrees notice we've got clouds and rain because that cold air came in and pushed the air up into the sky to make clouds and rain so here's a summation of what you need to know about cold front it's colder air pushing the warm air um, the warm air goes up gonna make clouds now these typically move faster than say a warm front because cold air can push very violently because it has a lot of high pressure behind it so cold fronts can not just form rain they can form storms and on a weather map they are drawn with this symbol right here now a warm front is exactly the opposite here I've got some cold air on top of me and warm air comes in now the difference with this is warm air is not going to push cold air up into the sky what's going to happen is my warm air is going to kind of mix a little bit but it's still it's going to wind up up here so I'm still going to get some clouds forming but it's because the warm air has to go up and over the top of the cold air look something like this now the difference between a warm front and a cold front is that a warm air mass can't push a cold air mass out of the way so it goes up and over the top now it also mixes with the cold air makes the cold air a little bit warmer as you get some mixing of the air right here so warm air masses don't change the air don't change the weather conditions very dramatically it's a very gradual change so here's a summation of warm fronts when warm air tries to push in the colder air but it the warm air rises up over the top makes clouds well because it doesn't happen very quickly it doesn't 
make storms. It's not violent weather. It's kind of like all day kind of rain and the weather slowly gets warmer as that warm air comes in. A cold front can change temperatures very dramatically in one day. Warm fronts take a little while to happen. They are shown on the weather map with a symbol like this. Now, because one front is pushing into the other, something's always moving. That place where they meet is always changing. So here we've got a situation where that's the point where they are meeting. The cold air is pushing into the warm air mass, but the cold air mass keeps pushing this direction. So that means the front ends up being over here as opposed to being right here. So you were standing right here before you had rain. Well, now once the front has come through, the rain is going to be over here. So fronts move because one air mass is pushing the other. So that means the clouds, the precipitation are going to be moving on down the road. But what if they're pushing into each other? And this can happen where neither one is pushing into the other and the front stays in one place. Now you're still going to get clouds form because the warm air is still going to be pushed up into the sky. So you're still going to get rain out of this because naturally the warm air is going to want to be up on top of the cold air. This is called a stationary front. This is where the two masses, air masses are meeting, but one's not pushing the other. So they only interact at one spot, a little narrow line. And that line stays in one place or it stays stationary. Now, this means you get long lasting precipitation, but you don't usually get storms. And it's represented on a map using a symbol like that. Now, because the, the rain stays in one place, you get a lot of rain in one place and that, that rain line is not moving on down the road, stationary fronts typically cause flooding. This is why you get too much water in one place at one time. This is if the front is stationary. If it's moving, it rains one place, then it goes on down the road. Stationary fronts are what typically cause flooding. Now, our last type of front is something a little bit different. And this is a, a, a typical picture here where we have warm air moving into cold air, and you know it's going to rise up and it's going to form clouds. But if you get a cold front coming in, immediately after the warm front. Remember, warm fronts are kind of slow moving. They don't happen very quickly. Cold fronts can move very, very fast because they have a lot of pressure behind them. So what can happen is if you have a cold enough air, it can push your air up, your warm air up very, very quickly, which makes for a very, very quick, violent type of weather event, typically very stormy, nasty weather. This is called an occluded front. An occluded front is when a cold front pushes a warm front from behind. And these are the types of front that give us our nastiest violent weather, nasty thunderstorms, uh, and typically uh, tornadoes. And they are shown on the weather map using that symbol there. Now, at this point, you should have all of this information here in your notes. Take a minute to pause the video. Make sure you have this. If you don't, go back and rewatch. Thunderstorms. A thunderstorm is a special type of storm, one that produces thunder and lightning. Thunderstorms always come from cumulonimbus clouds. That's the only type of cloud, the only type of storm cloud that can give us this kind of nasty weather that's going to produce thunder and lightning. A hailstorm is a thunderstorm that produces hail. Now, not all thunderstorms are the same. They are typically distinguished by their size. A single cell thunderstorm, that's where you have just one little cloud making a thunderstorm in one small little place. And you've all seen this before, you know it can be raining um, in one spot and you go five miles down the road and it's sunny. That's because the storm was caused by that one single cloud over that one little spot. A multi-cell thunderstorm is when you have three or more single cells that kind of start to grow together and that's called a multi-cell thunderstorm a little bit bigger you can see that here you can see the three separate clouds and how they're kind of getting in close to one another and they're eventually going to merge and possibly form into a bigger single thunderstorm a squall line a squall line is a line of thunderstorms typically right along the edge of a front where a cold front is pushing in very very violently you can see they are pretty linear. There's a line here. There's a line there. You can see it on this map. There's a line of thunderstorms ahead of our cold front that is coming in and pushing the air up very, very quickly. 
Now, a supercell, a supercell is a ginormous, huge thunderstorm cloud, typically with a mesocyclone in the center, a huge rotating, strong updraft in its center called a mesocyclone. These are the biggest, nastiest thunderstorms. Now, supercells are a problem for us in Georgia. They typically only form here in the Midwest, the middle part of our country. And the reason for that is because that's where we get the strongest interaction between cold and hot air. It's also a place in the middle of the country where the temperatures can change very, very quickly. You don't get supercells down here because the temperatures can't change that dramatically because of your proximity to that water. So here's a, a brief summary of the four different types of thunderstorms. Make sure you have this in your notes. On second check for understanding, you should have all of this information in your notes at this time. Now, thunderstorms happen. They all develop the same way. There are distinct steps that thunderstorms go through. What you see behind me here is the first step in the development of a thunderstorm. Notice this big cloud here. It's a big white puffy cloud. Well, those are called cumulus clouds. And this is actually the cumulus stage of thunderstorm development because all thunderstorms have to start with a cumulus cloud. Now that's a big collection of water. This is a hot summer day and the hot air is rising and taking water up into the sky and it's building this cumulus cloud. Eventually the cloud's gonna get big enough and full enough with water that it can form a thunderstorm. So once again, first step in the formation of a thunderstorm is this cumulus stage and it involves the cumulus clouds growing and getting bigger to the point where they'll hold enough water to cause a thunderstorm. So this right here is the mature stage of a thunderstorm. You can see there's a lot of rain coming down. You can see the trees moving around because there's all that wind caused by the rain pushing the air as it moves to the ground. There's lots of thunder, lots of lightning. This cloud got too big and now it's dumping all of this water that it can't hold anymore. Once this thunderstorm cloud runs out of water, it will move into what's called the dissipating stage of thunderstorm development. So once again, this is the mature stage of a thunderstorm. It's the middle stage, the second of the three stages of thunderstorm development. So now we're in the third stage of thunderstorm development. And all thunderstorms go through these three stages. This third and final stage of thunderstorm development is called the dissipating stage, where the cloud is dissipating or it's breaking up or it's falling apart. And you can see that there's not nearly as much rain now. The cloud has already dropped most of its water. And because it's dropped most of its water, it's not pushing the air as strong, so you notice the winds aren't pushing the tree as much. This thunderstorm is basically dying. It's almost over. It's dropped all of its water. It's not nearly as violent as it was just five minutes ago. In a few more minutes, this storm is gonna be gone. There'll be no more precipitation, be no more thunder and lightning. The storm will have run out of its energy, it will run out of its water, and it'll be over. Once again, this is the third stage of thunderstorm development called the dissipating stage, which is characterized by lighter winds, less rain, and the dying of the storm. So a check for understanding at this point, you should list the stages and the characteristics of thunderstorm development. Now, thunderstorms have to have thunder and lightning. So what is lightning? A definition of what lightning is, is it's just static electricity. It's the accumulation of extra charge, or extra electrons in one place. Now, how is lightning formed? Lightning is exactly the same thing you get when you shock yourself on something, uh, say like a metal doorknob after walking across the carpet. What happens in that process is you walk across the carpet, you pick up extra electrons from the floor. 
you rub off and you wind up with extra electrons all over your body. Well, nature doesn't like things to be unequal. So if you touch something or someone, nature's gonna make those extra electrons zap to the other thing, like the metal doorknob or another person. That movement of electrons, that zapping is all that lightning is, is that discharge of static electricity. What happens is we know that hot air rises. And when that air rises, it will take extra electrons up here into the sky. So we get a cloud and clouds end up having a bunch of extra electrons. So they end up being very negatively charged. They have a big buildup of static electricity. Well, now that means the ground is gonna be a little bit more positive because all of the electrons went up here into the cloud. Well, you know that opposites attract. You know that positives attract negatives. So eventually you get such a big buildup of negatives that nature says, nope, I, I can't have things be this unequal. I'm gonna zap some of those extra electrons back down to the ground. It's just like static electricity. You don't have to touch the doorknob to actually get shocked. You just have to get close to it and nature will take care of the rest. It'll make the extra electrons jump from you to the doorknob. And well, the same thing's gonna happen with a cloud, except on a just much, much bigger scale, that all those extra electrons are gonna jump back down to the ground. That's all lightning is. There are two types of lightning, basically, that we're gonna cover in this class, and that's cloud to cloud and cloud to ground. Cloud to cloud, you don't generally see, not at least like you see in this picture here, but clouds rub up against each other, just like your socks rubbing up against the carpet. So some clouds end up with more charge than the others, and when they touch each other, they zap one another. Typically, when we see that, it looks like somebody's up in the cloud taking a, a flash photography. You don't see it as dramatic as you do in this picture, but you do see this. This is the more classic type of lightning that, that, that we think of, and that's when the clouds end up with too much electrons and they zap back down to the ground to make the charges equal. So what's thunder then? Well, what happens when that lightning goes to the ground, it's exceptionally hot. All that static electricity can heat the air up to 50,000 degrees. And you know that hot things will expand. So when lightning goes to the ground and the air gets exceptionally hot, all of this air just really spreads out. It expands really, really quickly. Well, the lightning bolt only happens a split second and then the air immediately cools and comes back together and right here where the air comes back together it hits each other it's like your hands clapping together as a matter of fact you might have heard lightning or thunder being referred to as a thunder clap because that's what it is it's the air clapping together back here and when we talk about 30,000 feet of air coming back together that quickly, it makes a slapping sound that we call thunder. So what thunder is, is that clap of air coming back together after the air has gotten hot by lightning. Like I said, up to about 50,000 degrees. So this explains the process by which thunder is formed. This is also the reason why you always see lightning first and then hear thunder after, because the lightning has to end before the thunder happens. Now some data on thunderstorms. Where do we get thunderstorms? Where are thunder th thunderstorms most common? Thunderstorms are a lot more common around the Gulf of Mexico. And the reason is because that's where we have rising hot, wet air. Remember, you gotta have a cumulonimbus cloud. So you've gotta have hot air. That's typical down here. You gotta have water in the air to make the cloud, once again, which is typical down here in this area. So you get a lot more thunderstorms around the Gulf of Mexico. And Florida is the number one thunderstorm state. And the reason for that is because of those sea breezes. Remember, Florida is getting some dramatic sea breezes every day. So they, they have thunderstorms almost every single day because the air is gonna come together and it's going to rise. Now, even though the Gulf Coast has the most thunderstorms, there are a lot more severe thunderstorms in the Midwest, because this is where those super 
cell thunderstorms can form. They get more thunderstorms in Florida. They get thunderstorms in Florida almost every single day. But in the Midwest, where they get very dramatic changes in their air and they get the big fighting over those two different air masses, you can get big thunderstorms, those supercells. So when a supercell thunderstorm happens, you're going to have a lot more damage. You have a severe thunderstorm when you have a lot more damage, stronger winds, more hail, uh, more damaging rain. So more thunderstorms around the Gulf of Mexico, but more severe thunderstorms in the Midwest. Now, the corresponding data with lightning. If you have more thunderstorms around the Gulf Coast, you're going to have more lightning around the Gulf Coast, with Florida being the number one lightning state in the country. Notice that almost no lightning on the west coast because they don't have thunderstorms out west in los angeles thunderstorms are exceptionally exceptionally rare a bolt of lightning in in los angeles would be big news because they just don't get it now what time of day are thunderstorms more likely to happen notice it's going to be later in the afternoon because that's when the day is hottest and that's when air is rising the most the more rising air the more water going up the more likely you are to have formed that cumulonimbus cloud that you have to have for a thunderstorm why not as many thunderstorms at night well because the sun's down and temperatures are going down and air isn't evaporating to make clouds as much as it does late in the afternoon now what season Thunderstorms are a lot more common in the summertime because that's when the temperatures are hottest and that's when the air is going to be rising the most, taking more water up into the sky to make those cumulonimbus clouds. Now your final check for understanding should be these data points here, uh, describing how the lightning and thunder are formed, where the thunderstorms are, where the severe ones are. Um, where the lightning happens and the times of day and year that thunderstorms most likely happen. When you have completed your notes, you have all of these checks for understanding in your notes. Come see me for the notes quiz for today.